Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Hi, everybody. I'd like you to meet Teddy. He is one of the Beagles rescued from that horrible situation on the west side of the state. You're going to get to hear his story and find out how the rest of his brothers and sisters are doing, too. It's a big get for the city of Detroit that has everyone excited. To me, this is one of the most important recruitments we had. Coming up, how the owner of that building actually might have helped keep the future of car making in Detroit and a lot of tourists coming around. Also, the feds say it was a cold-blooded murder for hire plot and it was hatched in Eastern Market. $10,000. That's how much federal prosecutors say a Redford woman was saving up to have her husband killed. Let's get to Priya Mann, who's live in federal court where that woman just appeared a short time ago. Uh, Priya, the court documents reveal, I guess, there were a number of meetings that were put together to try to uh, hash this plot. Yeah, that's right, Devin. At McDonald's in Redford, and as you mentioned, the parking lot of Eastern Market, this is the criminal complaint, and in it, it details phone calls, text messages, and recorded conversations that the government says proves this woman was trying to hire someone to kill her husband. Kirsten Nicole Evans is accused of trying to hire a hitman to kill her significant other. The criminal complaint includes recorded conversations between a police informant, an undercover cop, and Evans. The police informant told Evans he had a cousin in Ohio named Milton who could do the job. Milton turned out to be an undercover cop. Evans said she was trying to save up $10,000 in the murder for hire scheme. Her alleged motive was her partner's life insurance policy, totaling $440,000. At one point, Milton asked Evans, what are we going to do? Evans said, I'm trying to do something about it, and I'm trying to do something about him. Evans then tells Milton that he works the third shift. When he leaves, he leaves at 8 o'clock at night and goes and gets a coffee before going to work. Milton asked if that would be a good time, and Evans stated that would be a perfect time. Later on, Evans asked Milton, how much do you want? Milton responds, I will do it for five, for five G's, a reference to $5,000, and asks, are you good with that? Evans responds, I got you. I got your five G's. G's. Milton asks, are you sure? Evan responds, yep, I got you for the five G's. Days after that conversation, Evans allegedly texted Milton three photos. The first, the return address on an envelope with the name and address of a business in Southfield, Michigan, which turned out to be the victim's workplace. The second, the back end of a vehicle parked in a driveway showing the license plate. That vehicle was registered to the victim and an ID card with the victim's picture on it. Evans was arrested a short time later. Now, in one recorded conversation, the police informant warns Evans not to spend any of that life insurance money, to which Evans agrees. Now, that police informant has been charged in an unrelated case, started cooperating with federal authorities for leniency. Evans will be back in court next month. Reporting live from federal court, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. All right, Priya. Our other top story at this hour, the Washtenaw County Sheriff declares a state of emergency inside the county jail. And that declaration comes amid concerns over unacceptably low staffing levels inside the lockup and says they've been like that for quite some time. Larry Spruill live at the jail tonight and Larry, we know you spoke to the sheriff and this is a big issue. Good evening, Sandra and Devin. A big issue indeed. As a matter of fact, the sheriff says that he wants to be a full staff ASAP, but he does not see that happening. Now, this is what he's facing. When it comes to normal staffing levels, it's about 8 to 10 percent. He starts to worry a little bit when it gets to 12 to 15 percent. As of right now, the current staffing level here at the jail is 23%. Things look to be business as normal outside the Washtenaw County Jail, but Local 4 found now it's anything but that on the inside. So we're at critical staffing levels right now that we don't anticipate getting out of anytime soon. Washtenaw County Sheriff Jerry Clayton tells me that's why he is declaring a state of emergency at the prison. They need more qualified employees and they need them right now. Normally we'd like to be at 8 to 10 percent vacancies, 12 uh, percent to 15. We start to get uh, very concerned. Currently they're at 23 percent. But hiring qualified staff continues to be a challenge. So we're at a, we're at a, we're at a point where uh, we can anticipate through the summer through vacations and retirements where our staffing's not going to get any better. 
Sheriff Clayton says he could shut down the jail and operate at a minimal staffing levels, but in his mind that only presents a bigger challenge over time. That's why hiring is top priority right now, especially as summer is just right around the corner. So how we have framed it is that we anticipate if we maintain the status quo and we don't do anything different, that come summertime, we'll have a state of emergency. And so the sheriff tells me that he stands by his decision to declare a state of emergency. Now, he says there are no issues when it comes to safety inside the prison, but he wants to get out there and be proactive. We're live in Washington County tonight. Larry Sproul, Local 4. And we know the sheriff mentioned summer. Larry, if they can't fill those openings by summer, what are the other options? Well, Sandra, the sheriff says the only other option is to have his staff and his officers work overtime. And if a push comes to shove, he will have to decline any summer vacations as well. But he says he does not want to do that. Sandra. All right. Thank you, Larry. Well, the rain and clouds have moved out. Uh, we've in some areas at least seen some sunshine to wrap up. We did day. see nice. some peaks of sun, but that's not the big headline. Let's get over to Ben. A big swing in temperatures, Ben, and now you're talking about frost overnight, too. Unfortunately, yes, Sandra and Devin. And yes, it was a very narrow window where we got to enjoy that 71 degree high at Metro. We're not anywhere close to that right now. Down to 58. In fact, the warmest temperature on the map currently is at 61. And we're starting to get close to the 40s here in parts of our north and west zone. So as the clouds clear out tonight and the winds relax, those temperatures are really going to accelerate their drop as we head towards daybreak. Metro zone lows at 38, but that is one of the warmer temperatures that we're going to see overnight. And yes, there will be some patchy frost. So we're going to look at your four zone forecast and see who's got the best chance of seeing that when we wake up in the morning in just a few minutes. Guys. All right, Ben, a major announcement today from Mayor Duggan signaling the Motor City is revving into the future. Yep, Waymo, uh, formerly known as Google's driverless car company, building an assembly plant right here in the city. Jason Colthorpe here now. This is a small company compared to the big three, but this is a big deal. A huge deal, guys, because for the city, it's a major win that comes right on the heels of Ford keeping its electric future in Detroit at the train station. Now another wave of technological manufacturing momentum that will cement the Motor City moniker for decades to come. We have uh, another really good day. Uh, it's a good day that Mayor Mike Duggan says came together fast. Between tax credits from the governor and a deal orchestrated partially by Dan Gilbert, Google's spin-off company Waymo is setting up shop in Detroit to install its self-driving technology in Chrysler Pacificas and Jaguars. So they're saying it'll be 100 to 400 jobs. Uh, and uh, they are already working away on the space. The space will be the American Axle and Manufacturing Plant off I-75, and it wants to start building its driverless vehicles in two months. 10 or 20 years, uh, maybe not me, but my kids and grandkids are going to be riding in cars uh, with no drivers, and they're going to be designed and built uh, in the city of Detroit with the moves we've made in the last year. Moves that include keeping Ford and its electric future in Detroit, which in turn keeps the engineering talent in Detroit and only attracts more of it with this Waymo announcement. If you take the strengths of Silicon Valley and the strengths of Detroit and put them together, uh, where do you end up making uh, these vehicles? And the conclusion, at least today, is you make them in Detroit. Now, I asked the mayor, does an announcement like this put some of the bring back some of the other big issues into the conversation like mass transit or things like that? And they said they're absolutely having those conversations right now, especially mass transit, exciting programs at the universities. This could really have a snowball effect. That's yeah, the kind sure. of announcement they want to hear. Right. Yeah. And I know you also had a chance to talk to the mayor, ask him some questions about the recall effort against him as well. Yeah, it was kind of the elephant in the room today with that looming out there. I asked him about it and he was pretty blunt to the two petitions that are out there right now that uh, hope to recall him. Here's what he said. Thank it's you. off topic, Mayor, but any reaction to the recall? Yeah, I think it's the third time in the last four years, so, you know, this is the way it goes. You no, know, it's, it's okay. This is, I mean, this is the third time, and uh, this is just the nature of the business these days. So of all the things I'm spending my time on, not too up there. Thank you. Shockingly didn't want to get into it too much, uh -huh. but... Uh,
There you go. No He's surprise. right, though. He has faced this before. Yeah. And so, yeah. All right. All right. Jay. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Vice President Mike Pence is coming to Metro Detroit tomorrow. Going to be in town for a fundraising event. While here, though, also expected to tour the Ford River Rouge plant in Dearborn. And there he'll have a discussion about the auto industry and the new NAFTA agreement or the replacement for NAFTA. The Vice President also stands to make uh, plans to make stops in both Detroit and in Taylor. And we'll be following his visit. We reported Sunday night Kelly Stafford, the wife of Detroit Lions quarterback Matthew Stafford, is back home after a 12 hour brain surgery. And last night she got real with an update on her recovery that she posted to Instagram. It reads sitting in this dark room in pain, but trying to hold off on meds because I want to see my kids. I want to be coherent and in the moment tomorrow. It'll have been a whole week that I haven't seen them and my heart aches. Balancing in general is incredibly hard right now. Balancing kids and brain surgery is nearly impossible. And of course, we continue to wish her the very best. Sure do. Uh, we are off and rolling on a Tuesday. Here's Kevin Dietz with what's coming up. His son was born inside a jail cell because the mother was locked up for driving on a suspended license. And that is just unacceptable to me. The ACLU says if the family was not poor, it never would have happened. Now the father is speaking out, supporting a plan to do away with cash bail in Michigan for nonviolent criminals. Also, how one Saginaw woman's fight over parking tickets sparks a surprise ruling in court, which could have a ripple effect across the country. Nick. He likes the camera, and he's going to have to get used to it because he's kind of a famous beagle. Why? He's one of the 32 rescued from that horrible situation in West Michigan, and now he has finally found his, I guess they call it forever, right? Forever, right, Teddy? Client first. New at six. A pizza delivery driver carjacked while on the job in Macomb County. Tonight, police believe the culprits are a pair of 16-year-olds. You'll see what cameras captured in our six o'clock report. A local towing company at the center of a big controversy now dealing with a major lawsuit. You'll hear why victims say they were targeted. Help me hang. New tonight. We want to go ahead and give you an update to a story we've been following for weeks now. You might remember more than 30 beagles were rescued from a testing lab, which is near Kalamazoo. Yep. Uh, you remember this was the video we showed you from the Humane Society of the United States exposing the lab that was using the dogs to test pesticides. Well, last week, those beagles were rescued, and tonight Nick Monticelli has the story of one of the beagles who now has a new home. Hey everybody, I would like you to meet Teddy. He is number five to be rescued from that horrible situation. Why? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> However, there's going to be a permanent reminder of what these dogs have been through that will really never go away. Go get it! Go get it! I'm sure you've heard the adage about a dog being man's best friend. It's okay. oh. Well, that couldn't be more true in Teddy's new St. Clair Shores home. She loves being outside. Greta Guest and David Rubolo saw the awful stories of the Humane Society of America's undercover investigation, finding 32 beagles exposed to daily torture. They were rescued, and the Michigan Humane Society started adopting them out one by one when they were ready. Teddy is number five. I just saw the post at 8 p.m., and I filled out an application right away. He first met his new sister Cleo at the Humane Society to make sure they would get along. Now she's teaching him the ropes, how to eat, play, go potty outside and more. And he is adjusting wonderfully. All of these dogs were set to be euthanized in July. Torture that will That's always be with him. Teddy's lab number is permanently tattooed under his floppy beagle ear. And when I picked this, this dog up, it was just so docile and loving. It was hard to believe that these could actually be happening. This could actually be happening to something like this dog. But now that's in the past. And yes, a dog can be man's best friend. But in this case, I think it applies both ways. The first night it was here, it slept right on my, my stomach here. It had both its paws draped over my shoulders and it rested its head right against my cheek. And I'm sold. In St. Clair Shores, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Pretty adorable. All right, Nick. Only a few of the Beagles have been placed so far, but more than 800 applications were submitted to the Michigan Humane Society, and the group says they are hoping to place the rest of them soon.
very, very sweet. What a nice a, ending to yeah. that story. My first puppy was a beagle, and I know they are fantastic. They really Sleepy. are. Classic, yeah, right? That's Great true. family dogs. Yeah. We've had a pretty nice day out again. Yes. The first part was fantastic. Mm -hmm. mm, the second yeah, part. Got a little dodgy there for a while. We're starting to go downhill, yeah. And that's going to eventually culminate in some really chilly temperatures tonight. But uh, the clouds have tried to get out of here multiple times today, and now we're just sort of getting some glimpses of sun. Uh, we'll call it mostly cloudy here at Gross Eel, Metro, and Ann Arbor. A little bit more sunshine back here to the west, but eventually all of these clouds are going to go away. And we talk about this all the time. When that happens at night and the winds calm down, that is a recipe for very uh, cold temperatures, and that's what we're expecting tonight. You can see the satellite, the back edge of that cloud cover is now starting to move into the central part of the state. So eventually we will get there. Uh, it's just been nice to have it here for most of the afternoon. You can see the clouds still out there in Mount Clemens. And that camera's moving a little bit. Sustained winds, they're 17 miles an hour. But the gust at Mount Clemens, 25 miles per hour. In fact, most of the area uh, still seeing those gusts anywhere between 25 and 30 miles per hour. But as soon as that sun goes down tonight, those winds uh, will go nearly calm overnight. And that's what's going to allow not only the temperatures to drop, but the air to become stable enough that we'll be looking for patchy frost in a few locations overnight. Cold front pushed that warmth all the way down to the nation's capital. It's 80 degrees out there. Pittsburgh's a temperature we saw earlier today at 71, but that is a far cry from where we're at now. Cold front will have an impact, obviously, tomorrow morning. Coldest start of the forecast in the 30s, but look at all this sunshine tomorrow, and we will recover to the 60s in the afternoon. Here's Thursday, and we've got another front poised to make its way through. May see a couple sprinkles there late Thursday night into early Friday morning, but most of Thursday and Friday are going to be dry. Maybe just a couple drops lingering for Friday morning's commute. So let's look at lows tonight. We're at 40 degrees with clear skies. That's going to be one of the warmer temperatures probably down in our south zone, but when we break it down in your four zone forecast, 39 in the city, we'll call it officially 38 at Romulus. South zone, yeah, we may see 40 down there in Luna Pier, but especially further inland away from the lakes, you're looking at mid 30s in Lenawee County. Some of the coolest numbers out here inland in our west zone, getting close to the freezing mark out here in Howell, Fenton, Flint. 34 is where you're going to start tomorrow morning and in our north zone, a whole lot of mid 30s there as well. Again, further outside of the city is where we're looking for that patchy frost, but not going to last long with 66 and tons of sunshine expected for the day. Warmest number coming Thursday and then we start cooling a little bit into the weekend. So having a repeat of Easter Sunday, Probably a little much to ask for, but we've got a lot of sun tomorrow. Don't forget, tomorrow we start our first severe weather alert radio day. We're going to be at the Meyer in Ann Arbor. That's on uh, Ann Arbor Saline Road, and we'll be out there starting for the noon show and then right on through 4, 5, and 6. So come out and see us uh, tomorrow at Meyer. Be a big day like it always is. Yeah. And a big day today around here, and big congratulations are in order as Local 4 is the proud recipient of two Edward R. Murrow Regional Awards. The first is for excellence in social media, and this is a first for us. It's yeah. a big win celebrating our multi-platform approach, and we want to send a big congratulations to Ken Haddad. He's our social media manager. And the second award is for excellence in sound. Photographers Alex Atwell and and uh, Hans Eilenfeld I, uh, won for their story on school bus racing. You may recall that story. It was terrific. And the sound on it was uh, so beautifully edited in flat rock. So congratulations to both of them. It is one of the gold standard awards in broadcast news. Big day for us yeah, around here. Yeah. Congratulations. Doc? Well, you know, artificially sweetened drinks may seem like a healthier choice compared to their sugary cousins. But are they really? Coming up, the serious risks linked to diet drinks. All right, Doc, but first, the brothers who said they helped stage the Jussie Smollett attack file, uh, file a lawsuit, not the actor they're going after. The attorneys. Next. The two brothers who allegedly faked the Jussie Smollett attack are now suing the actor's lawyers. In a federal lawsuit filed today, Abel and Ola Oshindairo claim the attorneys lied to reporters and tried to make it look as if they were the culprits in a real homophobic and racist attack. They say Smollett directed every aspect of the attack, including the location and the noose. The brothers are now suing for defamation. We want to end these malicious attacks and ensure that those responsible for continuing to destroy the reputation of the Chicago Police Department, the city of Chicago, and that of Ola and Bolo Ushundairo are held accountable. The brothers say they have suffered extreme emotional distress and damages to current and also prospective business relations. 
Across Michigan at this hour, the Sleeping Bear National uh, Dunes National Lakeshore having its first ever prescribed burn. The Park Service announced plans to burn along more than 900 acres of land. A prescribed burn is a tool to help uh, pre preserve the landscape. Even though you're burning it, many areas in the park will be closed to visitors during that burning period. Unclear exactly yet when it's going to take place since park firefighters need optimal weather conditions to go through with it. And a Saginaw woman who filed a lawsuit after her car tires were chalked by a parking enforcement officer has won in court. Allison Taylor filed that suit after she was issued 15 parking tickets in three years by the same parking enforcement officer. She claimed the officer chalked her tires to keep track on how long the car had been parked. And that, of course, violated her Fourth Amendment right, barring unreasonable search and seizure. Today, a federal appeals court agreed, saying chalking a car is simply unconstitutional. New at 530. They were an institution in Detroit for decades, but a few years ago they were forced to close. We'll tell you where this popular Coney Island is now. The district courthouse in Clinton Township has a new security detail, and she's serious about her job. Coming up, we'll introduce you to the goose that has a lot of people talking. The Defenders first brought you the story of baby Elijah, born on the floor of the Macomb County Jail. Now see how his parents are back in the ACLU's fight against cash bond. The story is coming up. Innocent until proven guilty. That's how the justice system is supposed to work, but thousands of Metro Detroiters who are arrested but not yet convicted will tell you otherwise. A lawsuit filed by the ACLU says poor people who cannot afford bail are being treated unfairly. And they're going to jail, and that can have all kinds of negative unintended consequences. Defender Kevin Dietz spoke to a man who learned about those consequences all too well and he shows us why his family is still traumatized to this day. Tonight the ACLU's cause has a new supporter, Tom Chesteen, whose son Elijah was born on the floor of the Macomb County Jail in 2016 because the baby's mother could not afford bail. Jessica Preston was pulled over for driving on a suspended license. She went to jail because she was too poor to pay the bail set by a judge. In jail, she went into labor and had a baby on the floor of the Macomb County Jail. The baby's father says it's had a lasting impact on the family. She doesn't sleep at all because of it. She has night terrors, nightmares. The ACLU says it's not fair. People with money can go home for minor offenses, but poor people have to go to jail. They're filing a lawsuit to try and put a stop to it. We're filing a lawsuit to end the shameful and unconstitutional practice of locking people up because they're poor, specifically too poor to pay bail. The ACLU says Michigan is wrong to demand bail before people are convicted, insisting bail is to protect the community and make sure the person charged comes back to court. In most cases, they say, bail is unnecessary. People who don't have money stay locked up. That's unequal treatment, it's morally wrong, and it's unconstitutional. We need to put a stop to it. It can lead to additional financial crisis, loss of jobs, loss of home, loss of children if you're a single parent. Still, most judges insist on bail. And if you're poor and can't pay, you go to jail. And we all pay for that. It costs over $165 a night to put someone up in jail every day. So we're talking about every night thousands and thousands of dollars. In many cases, those sent to jail didn't even have an attorney. A basic premise of our constitutional system is that you shouldn't be sent to jail with, if you don't even have an attorney to represent you to help advocate for your cause. That's happening every day here, and that's why we're filing a lawsuit to put an end to it. The ACLU's lawsuit is intended to send a message to judges across the state that in most cases, bond is not necessary. In Washington, D.C., 90% of people who are charged with crimes are released immediately, and almost all of those situations end up being perfectly fine. Elijah's father hopes the lawsuit is successful so that only potentially dangerous defendants are locked up before trial not people who happen to be poor. It was uncalled for, uh, irresponsible, 
from somebody that works for our judicial system, and that is just unacceptable to me. If you're a judge, Jessica Preston has her own lawsuit in federal court against the medical company that failed to send her to the hospital. The family says they'll do everything they can to support the ACLU's effort so that defendants who cannot afford bail do not end up locked up. Kevin Dietz, Defenders. All right, thank you, Kevin. Now here's a look at what we're working on coming up for tomorrow starting at 5. The last head of the state health department was charged with involuntary manslaughter, and that is just one of the issues facing the new director. We talk about measles every day. I get a report every day, often more than once a day, about the latest numbers and the latest on what we're seeing. Tomorrow at 5, I'm sitting down with the new man in charge of Michigan's health to talk measles, Flint, and the biggest concern that he has about the health of our state moving forward. It comes around every 10 years, the U.S. Census, but today the Supreme Court is hearing arguments over a question that could appear on the 2020 form. Is this person a citizen of the United States? Blaine Alexander takes a closer look at this contentious question. Well, hello to you from the Supreme Court. This is not a completely new question to the U.S. Census. It's been there before, but not on the main form since 1950. And now the Trump administration is trying to bring it back. It's a Supreme Court showdown over a single question on the 2020 census. Can the Trump administration ask a person's citizenship? 18 states are fighting to remove that question, saying it would scare undocumented immigrants away from participating in the census altogether. In fact, the government estimates as many as 6.5 million people would not fill out the form, meaning the population count that decides federal dollars for things like roads and schools could be skewed. It will so severely damage the accuracy of the census that six states are at risk of losing a seat in the House of Representatives. But the Trump administration argues the information is needed to help enforce the Voting Rights Act. He wants to know who's in this country. And I think as a sovereign nation, we, we have that right. Inside the court, the justices clearly split. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the court's only Hispanic member, calling it a solution in search of a problem. But Justice Brett Kavanaugh, a President Trump appointee, noting the United Nations recommends the citizenship question, one common in other countries. The accurate data you'll get from everybody else who does answer is worth the fact that there might be a very small, small number of people who refuse to respond. My community is severely affected by the lack of resources, and if this question does deter people, I can only see my community falling apart. Today, the majority conservative court seemed poised to let the question remain on the census, their decision expected by late June. And there is a rush to hand down that court decision. That's because the government needs time to print those census forms for next year's count. At the Supreme Court, I'm Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine, a great sight today as Oakland County Executive L. Brooks Patterson made his first appearance since announcing he has stage four pancreatic cancer. Take a look. He was at a news conference today. It was the kickoff event for the Brooksy, uh, the Brooksy Way Half Marathon. Uh, Patterson helped unveil the race's logo and give away grant money to local nonprofits. Patterson talked about why the event, which is named after his son, is so important to him. My son was in the front row and said, Dad, I want to run on that race. I said, it's great, a kid, young, strapping kid. And then three days later, two days later, he was killed. But because he had put that seed in my mind that he wanted to run in the race, uh, I brought this race committee together. This year's races take place in September at Oakland University. In good health tonight, sugar-sweetened drinks are linked to obesity, diabetes, and a host of other medical problems. And if you don't like water, a logical choice might be an artificially sweetened drink. But Dr. McGeorge is here with the surprising risks they might pose. Exactly, Sandra and Jason. You know, we know that Americans are eating way too much sugar, but a growing body of research suggests artificial sweeteners may not be a safer option. While the products may satisfy our urge for something sweet, the health results are no treat. We often reach for sugar substitutes in the hopes that they'll be a little healthier. But according to a new study, artificial sweeteners can actually increase health risks. Cleveland Clinic dietitian Lindsay Moore says the problem with too much sweet stuff is it actually trains your brain to develop a sweet tooth. 
whether you are choosing something that has real sugar, artificial sweeteners, um, or even a plant-based sweetener that has no calories, it's still turning on the center of your brain and training your brain to want more sweet things. The study looked at women between the ages of 50 and 79. Researchers found drinking artificially sweetened beverages was associated with an increased risk of stroke, heart disease, and even death. Women who drank two or more diet drinks a day had a 23% increase in stroke risk when compared to women who drank diet drinks less than once per week. Malone says artificial sweeteners also change our gut bacteria, which may be important. Work on cutting in half what you're doing right now and continue to cut it in half until you're not using any sweeteners. You know, maybe just on a special occasion or, um, you know, in a baked good or something um, on occasion. Now Malone says a good way to gauge whether your diet is too sweet is to see if fruits like apples and strawberries taste sweet to you. If the answer is no, you should work on lowering the sweet threshold of your palate. That's actually a good test. Or if water just tastes so strange to you. <laughs> you know, maybe <laughs> I should might drink. be a good indication. Water is probably overall the best drink for you. I right. will say yeah, that. Absolutely. For sure. All thanks, right, Doc. thanks, Doc. Mm -hmm. Food for thought tonight. You know, many of us take our meals for granted. The Gleaners Women's Power Breakfast this morning raised awareness of the 150,000 Michigan children who go hungry. The breakfast kicked off a month-long drive to raise a million meals. Just a dollar can provide six meals. And thanks to the event sponsor, who will be matching all of those donations. Back in 2015, we first told you about the Boulevard Cafe, a nondescript Coney Island in the shadow of Henry Ford Hospital. And back then, the owner was forced to close the beloved restaurant after 50 years in business. But tonight, there is some good news. Priya Mann shows us the Boulevard Cafe is back up and running. For 50 years, if you drove by Henry Ford Hospital, you would see the Boulevard Cafe in Coney across the street. Clearly, a lot has changed, but we have some good news. The Coney has finally reopened just minutes from here. Tashka Lujerai is back where she belongs. We do have another shot, so that's what's, that's what's good about it. In Detroit with her regulars. When we found this location, we were very happy. It was like, we have to go back to our people. Brian Harris has been coming to Boulevard Cafe in Coney for years. All the regulars come in, they know her by name, they know what they order. Local 4 was there in 2015 when the beloved Coney was closing. I'm going to miss this place, and I love their hairs, I love their breakfast. Henry Ford wanted to expand, and the Coney had to go. Since then, nurses and doctors have been among the regulars wondering where they would end up. It, it was crazy. I had actually, the other day, one of the guys came in, and he's like, he's like, how is this possible? He's like, I just saw the name, and I had to come inside because I knew it was you guys. I just knew it. Since closing, the Lugerai family opened up a Coney in Macomb County, but they wanted to come back to Detroit, the city they've called home for more than half a century since immigrating from Albania. We always wanted to just bring that family feeling at any restaurant or any place that we worked at. Now nestled near 75 in Warren, they're excited to be back where it all began. Thanks guys, I appreciate it. When it comes to the most popular dishes, it's a toss up between wraps and a skillet. So of course I had to indulge. It's great to see a Detroit staple back in the city. Reporting from Detroit, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Well, some assignments just pay off in right? space. Right, she, she got the good assignment she today. She did. Amazon makes getting things you need so easy. Returning things, not so much, right? But that is about to change in a very big way. Who the company is teaming up with that'll make sending things back a whole lot easier. Coco? A goose decided to lay her eggs in a pretty unique spot in Clinton Township. I'm surprised that he's so close to a lot of activity. Coming up, we'll show you how people are reacting to the goose. But first, doctors say it's a miracle. A good news update on the little boy thrown from a third floor balcony at the Mall of America. That's next. New at six. A couple runs out of time on their way to the delivery room. Oh my God! 911, what's that? Just the emergency. I, I need help now. My baby just got born on the side of the road. I'm on grass yet. So they had to improvise in a parking lot. You'll meet them and their impatient new addition, new at six. 
Plus, we're entering that time of year where we pull out our old sunscreen and cross our fingers that it's safe and still effective. New at 6 and Good Health, why that may be an even riskier proposition this time around. The five-year-old boy who was pushed off the third floor balcony at the Mall of America keeps improving. The family now says the doctors are just amazed at his progress. The family's pastor is calling this a miracle, even saying the doctors describe the boy's injuries as if he fell off his bike inside of fall, instead of falling 40 feet. The boy went through a very lengthy MRI, which showed very positive signs. His family now says he has a ways to go, but they are very hopeful he will make a full recovery. There's a brand new security guard outside of the courthouse in Clinton Township, one you definitely don't want to mess with. It's a Canada goose who's decided to nest inside a planter right near the door. And as our Coco McAvoy shows us, folks better be careful walking in. 41B District Court in Clinton Township is a busy place filled with people coming and going. Obviously coming to court is not always uh, people's first agenda, but... But it just may be now because... Take a look around. You'll notice a unique visitor outside of the courthouse. So she like follows you. <laughs> she's a Canada goose. Uh -uh. And she's getting lots of attention. Very unexpected. Very. <laughs> and questions. Where's the father? The goose planted her nest a few weeks ago with her mysterious spouse. I, I joked around with our employees that they're part of our new security detail because they greet everyone that comes in. Chris Frankovich says they had a rough start. They at first were a little aggressive and, and weren't sure of you know the people walking by. Now they blend right in. They kind of welcome people and, and watch them and as long as people don't get too close they're fine. Most people just walk on by. I wouldn't have noticed her, so that's maybe a good thing. But once they notice her, they flock to her and are even thinking of some names. I will probably name her Bella. Probably Clinton because it, the court's in Clinton Township. Well, Starks is a good name. It's the name of the street. Maybe a contest or something who can come up with the best name. That would be fun. Because she's now part of the 41B District Court family. Uh, I'm hoping that they, they make that their home and, and just kind of hang out on our property. I mean, everyone likes to see them. We'll have to wait and see once the eggs hatch. I think their story will be will be told for a little while here. Coco McAvoy. Hansons. A woman reported missing in Alabama found alive after several days. Police say she was reported missing after heading to the post office. The search for her ended when a passerby found her wrecked car. It was underneath a bridge covered in brush. She was taken to the hospital. Right now her condition is still unknown and it's not clear how she survived all that time trapped in her car. Usually department stores and Amazon don't get along, but one chain is now teaming up with the online giant. Could take advantage of this. Kohl's announced it will start accepting returns for items purchased on Amazon. Starting in July, all Kohl's stores will accept unpackaged returns from Amazon customers. It'll accept all eligible Amazon items without a box or a label and return them for free. This comes after Kohl's started carrying Amazon products in more than 200 of its stores. He just keeps on setting Jeopardy records, and now he's letting people in on just how he's doing it. James Holzhauer nearing a million dollars on Jeopardy, and in an interview with NPR, he says you have to pick your spots and then bet big. That's his strategy. He also says you've got to have a bankroll to bet. That's why he starts with big money questions, and you can watch Jeopardy tonight on Local 4 coming up at 7.30. If you do watch, that doesn't come as much of a surprise. He seems to... He re he always goes to the bottom of the board. And he's super confident, yeah, too. Local camp. 4 News at 6 is next. Here's Devin. Overlooking the real key to his success, he gets them all right. Yeah, that's, that's true. He knows all of the correct answers, or questions, of course, in that case. Coming up, we're working on stories from Clinton Township and Auburn Hills. Also, the city of Detroit about to take a knock on national TV about what some see as a lack of progress in the area around the LCA. Well, Mayor Duggan had something to say about that today. You're going to hear from him just ahead. And here's Coco McAvoy. Coco. Take a look at this surveillance video. It shows a delivery driver in Warren getting carjacked by a couple of teenagers. Coming up, we'll show you more of the surveillance video and tell you how police caught the team.